Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to give a, just a brief rundown of the rest of the American Revolution. I know the AP test doesn't focus on military history, but in order to give you a satisfying narrative, I want to just at least briefly go through the shape of the war, just so you have some sense of why the American colonists were able to be successful and why the British were defeated. So let's jump in and pick up our story with General Washington and General Howe. So, basic objectives for today should be pretty straightforward. I'm going to give you, again, the briefest rundown of all this stuff, and then we'll get back to our more standard narrative. So, when we last left our heroes, Washington was running for his life and the life of his men after losing the city of New York to General Howe. This chase across the majority of New York took the signif a significant portion of the second half of 1776 and was an absolute disaster for the newly created Continental Army. Not only did they, did, was it proven that they could not stand up to the might of the British army and the troops the British were putting in the field, but Washington was in danger of his army just dissolving. Most of the army was made up of recruits who had signed up for one-year terms, and after months of nothing but running from the British, Washington was really concerned that he wasn't going to get any of his men to sign on for another year, and his army was just going to melt away. So he desperately, as 1776 came to a close, Washington desperately needed some type of win in in order to convince his men to sign on for another year. So, at the, in December of 1776, Washington moved his troops across the Delaware River and commandeered boats in all four miles in all directions, trapping the British on the other side. This gave his troops a much needed breather, but didn't solve the problem of how do we inspire the troops to sign up again. Fortunately, Washington had one of his trademark, daring, incredibly complicated military plans. As hopefully you know from just sort of pop culture history, Washington's plan was to cross the Delaware River on Christmas. Uh, the, the river was, of course, partially frozen over, and so this was somewhat of a daring, dangerous crossing. Once he got over, here's the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware looking spectacularly heroic. Once he got his troops over, he divided them up into four columns and marched them through the night with orders to converge on Trenton, New Jersey. Trenton was the base camp of some German-speaking mercenaries known as Hessians. Washington felt like this would be a softer target because, you know, German mercenaries as opposed to British regulars. In the end, the plan went south. Only two of the divisions showed up where they were supposed to on time, but fortunately that was enough to overwhelm the German sentries, defeat them, and capture these Germans. This was, this was an incredibly important victory for the colonists because it provided them with well-needed supplies, prisoners, and at the same time, allowed them to allow Washington to inspire enough of his troops to sign on that he's going to keep a continental army in the field. After this victory though, Washington had a significant problem, namely that a much larger British force commanded by General Howe was in the area and he had to find a way to outmaneuver and escape from that British force. Washington again came up with a daring plan right outside the city of Princeton, New Jersey. Washington was able to trick the British into thinking that he was trapped up on a hill. So when General Howe de uh, deployed his troops below, thinking Washington would have to come down the hill at some point and would be trapped, Washington left a skeleton force along with a few cannons up on the hill with orders to fire sporadically at the British, convincing them that he was still there. And he had a secret night march moving his troops down back roads paths that the British did not know about and he decided to attack the British rear guard and baggage train. Even though it was only a small fraction of the British troops that Washington attacked, the, the fighting was incredibly fierce, and it led to another one of Washington's most famous moments. In the heat of the battle, with the Continental Army about to break, Washington famously rode out between the two troops, taking off his coat and waving it above his head wildly to attempt to inspire his troops to keep fighting. Both sides opened fire at this point, and with bullets whizzing past in all directions, Washington continued to shout madly and inspired his troops to rally and push the British back. This helps build the mythology of George Washington as an almost invincible and unbelievably brave hero. Uh, he apparently had bullet holes through his cloak, but none of them actually hit him. And the victory at the Battle of Princeton secured the escape for the colonial army and the capture of more badly needed British supplies. From there, the British decided to march on our capital of Philadelphia with the understanding that you take the capital, you take the Congress, the war might be over. Washington moved his troops to try to intercept the British at a battle called Germantown. And at the Battle of Germantown, 
Washington again divided his force up into several different columns with an attempt to outflank the British, but incredibly brutal urban fighting prevented these groups from uniting together. The British were able to defeat each of Washington's separate columns in, uh, in sequence and were able to escape. Despite this, Washington's troops did acquit themselves, fighting very bravely and holding discipline against the British, even if the British troops were able to push through Washington's forces and capture the city of Philadelphia. Fortunately for the Americans, the, the delaying actions of Washington's troops allowed the Continental Congress to escape and the war to continue. The British got to winter in, in, the, the relatively, in relative luxury in the city of Philadelphia. Well, the colonists had to go to Valley Forge, as we see Washington writing here, uh, trying to get more supplies, more, uh, more supplies, more guns, more food for his troops. Despite this, Congress did not provide Washington with supplies, and the winter at Valley Forge was incredibly brutal. The men had no, no shelter, limited, uh, limited clothing, limited food, and the, the winter led to significant disease and death amongst Washington's troops. The one silver lining of Valley Forge is we started to see the first European officers showing up. Dr. Franklin had been dispatched to Europe in order to recruit officers to help supplement the Continental Army, and so we get people like the young noble, the Marquis de Lafayette, and more importantly, the Prussian Baron von Steuben, who uh, fought, who uh, were able to help train Washington's army into a more cohesive, more uh, effective fighting force. The Baron von Steuben was essential because he was a Prussian military officer who was dismissed from the Prussian military, likely due to his homosexuality. And he endeared himself to the colonists, both for his snappy dressing and for the fact that whenever they made mistakes in drilling, he would curse at them angrily in German, which they found hilarious. And so, in the aftermath of this awful winter at Valley Forge, Washington emerges with a relatively effective, well-trained fighting force that he's desperate to use to try to win a decisive battle against the British. The attempt, this, the attempt was made at a battle called Monmouth Courthouse. Washington's plan was less convoluted here. Basically, a forward force under the command of Charles Lee was to pin down the British troops, while Washington's main force would deploy and hit them in the flank. This would hopefully break the British Army and allow for a decisive victory for the Americans. Unfortunately for Washington, Charles Lee greatly resented the fact that he wasn't made commander-in-chief of the American forces, partially because of his uh, extensive European military service, and he disliked Washington personally. So either from a personal grudge or because he may have, historians believe that he also may have been a traitor at some point or had uh, been working for the British, but there's no actual confirmation of this. Either way, as opposed to attacking, Lee's troops, once they engaged, then withdrew. And Washington, his army arriving, crashed into General Lee's retreating force, and Washington freaked out. He cursed at Lee, which almost never happens. George Washington is not the type of man to throw around profanity lightly. He removed Lee from command. He tried to remobilize the army to carry out the plan. But by this point, the British man were managed to escape and managed to withdraw back to New York City out of the reach of Washington's forces. So Washington is robbed of his potential decisive victory and where he's, the war is going to continue. The British, again, were able to withdraw back up to New York City. Washington moves his army up to mirror them, waiting for another opportunity. And there he's going to sit for the better part of three years. While all this is happening, Native Americans are involved in the fighting. Uh, there's sporadic fighting all across the frontier. Native Americans generally allied themselves with the British, as we see here, because they felt like the British would do more to constrain the westward expansion of the American colonists. But there were also, uh, there were also Native Americans who fought on the side of the Americans, and it's not necessarily determinant. The, one of the decisive battles, and what's often considered the turning point of the war, is the Battle of Saratoga. With the British force significantly diminished, General John Burgoyne to takes command of an army in Montreal with the intention of marching it down across upstate New York, meeting up with the British troops already stationed in New York City, and then they'll have enough local superiority to crush Washington. The Americans obviously don't want this to happen. There's a number of different delaying forces, uh, including Benedict Arnold's great victory at Fort Stanwyck, delaying another British force. 
and the Americans tried to slow down Burgoyne as much as possible, using guerrilla tactics, using local militias, chopping down trees in front of his troops. But honestly, Gentleman Johnny slowed himself down with his constant partying. He uh, brought fancy foods and drinks and would have massive balls and parties every night. And the fact that he needed to bring all of these supplies meant that his army slowed to a crawl. There were a number of attempts to slow the British down and bleed them dry, but the final battle happened in Saratoga, New York. The Battle of Saratoga was an attempt to stop the British advance and trap them against the Hudson River. The hero of these three of these four days of fighting was a guy that was America's greatest hero, Benedict Arnold, who probably drunkenly, uh, who probably drunkenly were, was able to rally the American sharpshooters on the sort of northern flank and stop the British from breaking out of this American trap. With his forces now trapped with Americans and increasing numbers of militia coming in on one side and the Hudson River on the other, Burgoyne had no opportunity for an effective breakout. And with uh, the British forces in New York refusing to stir themselves and come to his defense, eventually he was forced to surrender. This was incredibly decisive and often considered the turning point of the war because not only did we take a British army off the table, but John Burgoyne himself was captured and all the British supplies were captured. And this finally convinced, here's the uh, account of the surrender of Burgoyne, if you're interested, pause and take it in. It also was able to, uh, Dr. Franklin was able to convince the French to now openly begin aiding the Americans. The French had been low-key aiding the Americans, providing troops, uh, providing supplies and some uh, individual French officers secretly and also loans. But now the French are going to formally join the war, signing a permanent treaty of friendship and alliance with the United States and giving us the things we desperately needed, guns and ships. Benedict Arnold then betrays the American cause. Benedict Arnold was upset about the lack, of, uh, the lack of recognition that he got for his pivotal role at the Battle of Saratoga. Most of the credit was given to Horatio Gates, and he was also in substantial debt, some of it acquired by him, some of it acquired by his wife. And so he went into negotiations with the British to betray the American cause for money. Unfortunately for Benedict Arnold, and fortunately for the American cause, the British spy, John Andre, who was trying to negotiate this, uh, this treason, was captured by Washington's forces and hanged, revealing Benedict Arnold's treachery. Arnold then had to flee literally hours before Washington was set to arrest him, and this is how Benedict Arnold went from what could have been one of the greatest heroes in American history to the, one of the greatest villains and a name synonymous with treason. From here, the British, not sure how to continue to, to pursue the war, brought their forces down south. Georgia had been occupied since 1778. We haven't talked about this because Georgia. And so <clears throat> British forces under General Cornwallis launched southward and with the goal being march north, sweep the patriots out, mobilize loyalists, and potentially, if possible, start up a general slave uprising. The plan originally went very well. The capture of Charleston went somewhat smoothly due to the power of the British Navy. And so the only major city in the southern colonies fell under British hands. But as Cornwallis started to march north, continental forces under the command of Nathaniel Green and some others were able to fight a series of delaying attritional battles to wear down the British, tire them out, kill as many men as possible, and start getting rid of their supplies. By using guerrilla tactics, drawing the British into expensive engagements, and using uh, generals like Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, to stage rearguard actions, the colonists were able to lead Cornwallis on a, on a chase across most of the southern colonies, with each battle, even the ones that were British victories, leaving the British somewhat diminished as far as troops, supplies, and morale. Meanwhile, the Americans were able to draw more troops from a loyalist population that was becoming increasingly supportive of the patriot, sorry, from a patriot population that was becoming increasingly supporting of their, supportive of their cause because of harsh British tactics. Specifically, a, a dragoon named Bannister Tarleton was famous for not taking prisoners and massacring colonial militias, which turned more of the South against the British. So, with his supplies running low and victories meaning more or less nothing because the Americans generally withdrew before the battle could be decisive, Cornwallis moved up north, eventually camping on a peninsula called Yorktown. 
Unfortunately for Cornwallis, his plan to get resupplied with British ships failed when the French fleet showed up, drove off the British Navy, and was able to blockade the Chesapeake Bay. Washington then speed marched his troops down from New York, being finally convinced of the, the, the potential of this opportunity, and was able to invest the city surrounding Cornwallis at Yorktown. With a joint French and American force surrounding his troops and for the French Navy occupying the bay, Cornwallis really had no choice but to, uh, but to surrender. Several American attacks and a long siege had, with, had uh, weakened his forces, and so with no chance of escape, Cornwallis surrenders, and the war comes to a close. This battle did not necessarily have to be the climatic final moment of the war, but in general, British morale had fallen. The British desire to fight had decreased, British debt had substantially increased, and in London, it was decided that it was going to be cheaper and more efficacious to negotiate a diplomatic solution with the Americans as opposed to continuing fighting. This did not, of course, mean that the British were happy about this, as you can see in this half-finished painting, where, where, the British, where the British negotiators refused to sit down to have this moment commemorated. So, with that, the war comes to a close, and now we have to figure out what comes next. Will the Articles government be able to effectively govern this new United States? How will they solve the various problems, both left over from the war and that had preceded the war? And what direction is this country going to go moving forward? These are the issues we're going to tackle next time. Thank you for listening.